Hello and welcome to another Zoom meeting and podcast of Here's Tom with the Weather. And now for the free amble. Here's Tom with the Weather is the podcast that examines recovery from every angle, a safe space for open-minded discussion about those issues or perhaps even taboos that affect recovery. These are the topics often whispered about in church basements or grumbled over by the bleeding deacons and the big book thumpers that are verboten or scoffed at. We want to give free voice to those subjects that get alkies, the alky witches and warlocks burned at the stake or at the very least hounded out of their home groups. And just a quick aside, we run this account for free, so we welcome any contributions. It's not a Tradition 7, it's just a kind donation via PayPal to gilwriter at hotmail.co.uk. That's G-I-L-W-R-I-T-E-R at hotmail.co.uk. And today, this is a very special episode. I'm, I'm very excited about this, is that we're very privileged to have um, a fantastic presentation about the life and times of a true AA pioneer, Marty Mann. And the presentation is going to be conducted by Miley out of San Francisco. And with that, I'm going to shut up and hand it over to Miley. There you go, Miley. Welcome. Hi, everyone. My name is Miley. I live in San Francisco. I'm so happy to be here. I'm going to be um, presenting a PowerPoint presentation today. So for those of you that are listening, I'll do my best to describe some of the photos. And But I, I think... Uh, it, it should go well, whether you're seeing it in person or just listening to audio. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen right now. This is a, there we go. And I'm going to do the slideshow. There we go. And now um, I actually can't see anyone, but um, if you could just indicate to me that you, you see the full screen, that would be really helpful. It's we perfect. Can see it easy. Fantastic. Wonderful. All right. Thanks very much. So again, um, this presentation is called Mrs. Marty Mann, The Lady, The Legend, The Lesbian. And again, my name is Miley T. I live in San Francisco. And today is April 11th, 2022. My sobriety date is July 13th, 1984. And for that, I am very grateful. Um, the uh, Most of the information I, I've uh, collected over the years has come from this fantastic biography. The biography is called Mrs. Marty Mann, and it's by Sally and David Brown. And you'll notice on the cover that Mrs. is in italics. And we're gonna learn a lot more about that later. And then it also has a subheading where it says, the first lady of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now that, that's a question that we're also going to be discussing. Uh, is Marty really truly the first lady of AA? Now, her fam the, the family of Sally and David Brown has given me permission to share that Sally had 42 years of sobriety when she passed, and David was a grateful member of Al-Anon. I had the great good fortune of meeting uh, Sally B, and um, she autographed the, the biography for me. It says, uh, the best of wishes to Miley. And Sally passed in, on December 28th, 2019, at the age of 96. It was really such an honor to meet her. I've also had the pleasure of meeting all four of their adult children who are very um, who are very supportive of their parents, this project, and they've also seen this presentation. I'm very grateful for them. Their parents really did an outstanding job. Um, sometimes people say, oh, Miley, you should write a book, but honestly, the books have been written <laughs> and I'm so grateful for that. Now, I also did some research in the following publications. One is called The History of Gay People and Alcoholics Anonymous from the Beginning by Audrey Borden. And then Alcoholics Anonymous, the big book, our basic text, um, Marty's story is called Women Suffer Too. And that's in the second, third and fourth editions. And the subheading under her story says, Despite great opportunities, alcohol nearly ended her life. Early member, she spread the word among women in our, in our pioneering period. Other sources include National Newspaper Archives, Vogue Magazine Archives, the wonderful AA Grapevine Magazine Archives, Ancestry.com, I created a family tree for Marty to learn more about that. And then Syracuse University Library Archives, and the National Council on Al Alcoholism has their archives at Brown University. I had the pleasure of visiting the Grapevine offices. This is my, uh, my wife, Susan, the two of us. And we were really pleased to go and see how they do the layout. The Grapevine, for those of you who don't know, is the, uh, our meeting in print. And um, you're going to learn more about uh, Marty's role in that as well. 
Uh, the Grapevine magazine is in the same building in New York City as AA World Series, AA World Series, AA World Services, and the AA Archives. Uh, in 1957, Bill Wilson said, we're trying to build an extensive, uh, extensive records, which will be of value to a future historian. Now, I also had the great fortune of meeting Lori D and we've become very good friends. I interviewed her in December of 2020. She was friends with Marty for like 10 years in the 1960s. Um, uh, Lori was, uh, Marty was instrumental in helping Lori get into graduate school and it was a professional relationship connected to the National Council on Alcoholism. Lori currently has 55 years of sobriety and she's 82 years old. Uh, she came out at the age of 20 in 1959. She, uh, the information that Lori's provided has just really improved this presentation a great deal. So I'm going to go ahead and jump in. Marty Mann was born in 1904 in Chicago. She had her first drink at age 17, her social debut in age 20, which tells us a little bit about her uh, class. And at age 22, she married and she actually eloped. And um, she was only married for three months. And she immediately returned to using her maiden name, which is Mann, that's her family name, but continued to go by Mrs. for the rest of her life. After uh, she left her husband of three months, she went to their West Coast uh, ranch in uh, her parents' West Coast ranch in New Mexico and in order to get a quicker divorce. There she um, became friends with Amelia Earhart, who is a very famous pilot here in the United States. And at age 23, she had the opportunity to even go flying with Marty. And this is detailed in, in, her, in the biogra biography. Now, this is Marty's parents. Um, Marty's father was a multimillionaire, but he was also an alcoholic and a gambler. He filed bankruptcy 17 days before the stock market crashed. Uh, Marty was 26 years old and now financially on her own. So right around 1929, this is when the stock market crashes and many, many, many people lose their fortunes. So Marty moved to London in 1930 and she stayed there for six years. So she was there from age 26 to 31. And there she fell in love with a photographer named Barbara Kerr Seamer. Now I just thank the Tate Museum because they gave me permission to use these photos in this presentation, as well as a love letter uh, written from Marty to Barbara. And um, they worked together. And Barbara cared very deeply for Marty and really encouraged her to keep, quit drinking and, and was a great help in, um, in helping to sustain Marty during as she reached her bottom of alcoholism. Here's the very brief beginning of this wonderful letter that's in the Tate Museum. It was written in uh, May 1st, 1931, and, uh, and is written where Marty is in Paris and Barbara is in London. And she's saying, my own darling baby, I miss you so terribly, but it's like an awful empty ache. Every time I come back to the room, I curse the fact that you aren't here. And every time I go out of it, I long for you to be going with me. I love you so much, my sweetie. I wish I had a letter from you tonight. Now the letter goes on and on and on to talk about who she's having dinner with, what they're wearing, some other photographers, the quality of their work, and then more love and more love. So um, it's really, I'm so grateful these letters still exist. Here's some more photos from the Tate Modern. And this is from, again, from Barbara Kersimer's um, photo albums. And um, Barbara's uh, partner at the end of her life gave all of these photo albums to the Tate Museum. And thank goodness for people honoring history and knowing that these things will be such treasures in the future. So this is uh, where Marty and Barbara and their group of friends are now in the south of France in the Riviera. And you'll see it says Hotel de Port. And I actually went and visited there last, um, last fall and took some photos of the hotel. I was able to see exactly where they were staying right there. Gorgeous area. And this is Marty with some of her friends. I love this photo. These are all four of these are women. And, uh, and, um, and again, these are all from the Tate. And this is Marty highlighted on the right side. 
Now, this is this photo. This uh, this group of friends, they were called the Bright Young Things, and the Brit British press was fascinated with them. They were socialites, and these photos are taken around 1932, right around when Marty's beginning to lose control of her drinking. Marty's up here in the upper left-hand corner, and all these other people are very interesting. They're artists. Uh, most of them, I believe, are lesbian and gay. And they um, were very fascinating people in their own right. I don't have time to get into, into their lives, but um, but they they were very interesting. So this is some photos of the same hotel where they were staying. This is what it looks like currently 90 years later. Yeah. And here I am again, and there's my wife and the town is uh, Toulon. And again, again, Marty and Barbara and other socialites. So Marty also socialized with people like Vita Sackville West and Virginia Woolf. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. They're English authors. And, um, and a couple of things I can tell you about them. They're Again, they're both British, they're writers, and they both had husbands. And this is something you might hear more in, throughout the presentation, but it was very common for lesbian, gay, bisexual people to marry each other back there, in, back in the day, simply to survive. So um, this was not a secret, the, the Marty, you know, the, like this relationship between Virginia Woolf and Vita Sackville West. In fact, there was just a film made about it. There's books of their love letters, but this is not something, this is something that their quote unquote husbands were aware of. And uh, you'll see, you'll hear this more and more as uh, different people I discuss. And this is, of course, a very famous Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas. They're actually both from the Bay Area, which is where I'm from in Northern California. And uh, Marty frequented the salon. This artist salon is really interesting. Many, many famous people went there. And um, it was often, their home was often called the First Museum of Modern Art. And they showcased work by Picasso, Matisse, Brock. And um, this is, a, and the reason I show you these is just to simply give you a flavor of how, how high Marty was flying, <laughs> you know, the company she keeps, some of the most elite people, you know, and yet you'll soon find that she's going to learn every, lose everything as a result of her drinking. Now, uh, this was the last job that Marty was able to hold in, in Europe. Uh, she worked for the Royal Opera House um, during the opera season, the Covent Garden Jubilee. And this is 1935. Later that year, Marty attempts suicide while drinking, and she spends six months in London's orthopedic hospital, recovering from a fall from a second story window. Now, even Marty, uh, in, in, I've heard many recordings of her speaking, and sometimes she says she's not 100% sure whether it was a suicide attempt or a, or a fall because she was in a complete blackout. And this, she suffered so much. The reason she was in the hospital for six months in London was that she fractured both hinges of her jaw. She lost all her lower teeth. She broke a leg and a hip, and she bit off both sides of her tongue. She actually went up to Scotland for a while to recover. Some uh, A nurse from the hospital took her in, and uh, she was able to spend uh, quite a long time up in Scotland. And then, and then she returned to London, and right away she starts drinking again. She's unemployable, and she would rent a chair in Hyde Park for a shilling, and she would sit huddled there drinking, and her ex-lover Barbara would come and find her there in the park and try to persuade her to stop drinking, and eventually would help persuade her to go home back to the United States. And Marty's quoted as saying, I felt lost, homeless, and friendless. Barbara was able to help gather the money together among their friends so that Marty could afford a, a return um, trip uh, on the actual Queen Mary, which is a very beautiful boat. But unfortunately, Marty missed all of it because she was in a blackout the entire time. Um, her mother and sister picked her up at, at the dock. This is a Christmas time. It was freezing cold in New York. And they waited for hours as every other passenger disembarked. And once the entire ship was empty, Marty was carried down the gangplank on a stretcher, too drunk to walk. Now, this is an interesting uh, tidbit. Um, in Marty's story in the big book, uh, I'm just going to read this paragraph briefly. She wrote, that night I got very drunk, which was, which was usual, but I remembered everything, which was very unusual. 
I remembered going through what my sister assured me was my nightly procedure of trying to find Willie Seabrook's name in the telephone book. I remembered my loud resolution to find him and ask him to help me get into that asylum he had written about. I remembered asserting that I was going to do something about this, that I couldn't go on. I remembered looking longingly at the window as an easier solution and shuddering at the memory of that other window three years before and the six agonizing months in the London hospital ward. So this is very interesting. W Willie Seabrook's name is actually in the big book. And then when I was looking at these pictures of her in France, I realized that there's also photo photos of Willie Seabrook. He was with them in the south of France. In the upper right-hand corner, that's a picture of Willie Seabrook. And then the, the purple arrow shows a picture of Marty. So it's very interesting. They had actually been vacationing together in the south of France together. Sadly, Seabrook committed suicide in 1945. So it's very interesting. His name's in the big book. He, I'm sure, was well aware of Alcoholics Anonymous. He was connected to Marty. But sadly, he was unable to quit drinking on his own. Um, so Marty does in, it does in fact find an asylum. In New York, 1936, Marty is now a low bottom drunk. She's admitted to Bellevue Hospital as a charity case. Marty stayed there for six months. You know, when I think about now just how far Marty went down, I'm reminded, of course, in the promises that says, no matter how far down the scale we have gone, we'll see how our experience can benefit others. And that's a, this is a perfect example of that. You know, no matter how far down the scale Marty went, she's going to use this experience and she's going to help carry the message to th tens of thousands of women. You know, that even though she's here in a mental institution, even unable to pay, she's still going to turn this around thanks to AA. Now, here's an advertisement from Blythewood. Um, I, I really uh, I appreciate someone sent this to me. Really nice guy back east. And, um, and you'll notice um, it says Harry Tebow. Now, this is a name you're going to hear more of in the future in AA history uh, because he'll go on to help Bill Wilson with his own depression. But right now, he's just running this, this psychiatric asylum. It's in Connecticut. I was actually able to visit there um, in December. And, uh, and so uh, it says here, Marty transfers to Blythewood Sanitarium, a, a in psychiatric inpatient center in Connecticut, where she remains a charity patient for 15 months. So now basically Marty was hospitalized for 21 months total. And in the, the big book story, uh, Marty tells us, when I entered a sanitarium for a prolonged and intensive psychiatric treatment, I was convinced that I was having a serious mental breakdown. Now, this was not a locked sanitarium, and Marty and her friends, these are two women that were also patients there, this is them returning from a drinking escapade, and it was July 4th, 1938. The biography, biographer, Sally and David Brown, speculate that they may have actually been going to Fire Island. This was a very well-known or not at the time it wasn't well known, but it was a, a, a sort of a secret gay community um, and, they, and where Marty had socialized quite a bit um, on the, off the coast. And, uh, and it's likely that the three of them had been there. Now, um, this is a Blythewood Sanitarium, and these are photos that I took. I was there again in December of 2021. I, it was, it's a sanitarium chapel. It's really one of the only things left of the sanitarium. I contacted the minister and um, he was gracious enough to show us around. And he actually let me go up there and ring the bell, which I found very moving. I left my AA chip there at the church and, and uh, it was really very moving. I was so glad and I was so grateful. Um, um, I don't know if, if all of you have heard of the um, historic home of Bill and Lois Wilson. It's called Stepping Stones. And it was so nice. My, my friend Sally, who was the director of, Sally, of Stepping Stones, drove us around uh, Connecticut. And it was really so special to spend that time together. And, if, and again, if you're unfamiliar with Stepping Stones, check out their website. I believe it's steppingstones.org. And you can even, you can visit in person, but you can all, they also have tours online now. And it's quite wonderful to see where Bill and Lois lived. It's essentially a museum. Now back to Dr. Harry Tebow. In 1939, a pre-publication copy of the AA book is sent to Dr. Harry Tebow. So, and you can see it's in small writing above 
my text, it says Alcoholics Anonymous. And below that, it says Publish Works Publishing Com Company in New Jersey. And for those of you that are interested in the history of the big book, what they did was before they printed it, they got a pre-publication copy and they sent it out to rabbis and ministers and doctors and psychiatrists and anyone they thought might be remotely interested in helping alcoholics. And the idea was they wanted to get their feedback. So they, they sent it to Dr. Tebow and it just so happened that, that Marty was there. Dr. Tebow looked at it and he passed it on to Marty. And what a blessing that was. And that was the connection between Marty and the very first connection to Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, this is an old copy of the grapevine from 1966. And this was written by Bill W. And I don't like to assume what people know and what you don't know, but Alcoholics Anonymous has two co-founders. has And one is Bill W., Bill Wilson, and, um, and then Dr. Bob. Dr. Bob's in Akron and Bill Wilson's in New York. And so Bill W. wrote this in the AA grapevine in July of 1966. And he's describing when Marty read the pre-publication copy of the big book. And um, he's also referring to her friend, Granny, who is another patient there. So it says, at first, the book made little impression on this pair. Indeed, it's heavy larding with the word God so angered Marty that she threw it out the window flounced off the grounds of the Swank Sanitarium where she was and proceeded to tie on a big bender. Now, it, the story goes on about how more, you know, Marty's drinking and da, da, da. she comes back to Dr. Tebow, says, I can't stop drinking, I need help. And Dr. Tebow says, well, you better read that book. And then, so, and then Bill's, Bill's article goes on to say, forthwith, she attended a meeting. It was at Clinton Street, Brooklyn, where Lois and I lived. Returning to Blythewood, she found Granny, another alcoholic patient, intensely curious. Her first words to him were these, Granny, we are not alone anymore. This meeting was held on April 11th, 1939. So essentially what we're hearing here is that Marty's very first AA meeting was at Bill and Lois's house. That's about as insider as you can get okay <laughs> and that's where these meetings were held and and this is a photo of lois wilson in front of the clinton street house brooklyn and i have this photo courtesy of stepping stones a historic home of bill and lois wilson and this is lois's girlhood home so when when they talk about the early days of aa being at clinton street brooklyn that was lois's girlhood home and that bill and lois live there unfortunately because of Bill's drinking and because he was also then working so hard on the big book, he, they were unable to maintain the mortgage. They lost the home, the bank foreclosed. So Lois lost her girlhood home. And according to Lois, they moved 51 times before arriving at Stepping Stones in 1941. So Bill and Lois were essentially homeless. They'd stay in places like, um, in the clubhouses in New York. They'd stay at the homes of AA members. And for 51 times, they stayed in 51 different places until they finally, while well, they're trying to get this big book off. So you can just see the level of sacrifice so many people made for us. Now, this is again, Bill and Lois, and this is a uh, this photo is of Bill and Lois at Stepping Stones. And then this is the Lois's book, Lois from Members. It's her memoir. And Marty is quoted in her biography as saying, Lois did as much for me as any alcoholic. And in the memoir, Lois writes, quote, I well remember the day she came. Marty was afraid of what she would find at the meeting. So she preferred to stay upstairs with me. I finally persuaded her the AAs wanted and needed her. We went down together. Marty stay at Blythewood Sanitarium for six months after this meeting. Bill and Lois would visit Marty at Blythewood to offer encouragement. Now, can you imagine having Bill and Lois visiting you in a psychiatric sanitarium? My goodness. Now, here's a letter. My friend Mike, who uh, runs um, Recovery Speakers, that's also a fantastic website that has uh, so many history talks. If you're interested in AA history, Google Recovery Speakers. It's all there for free. It's quite wonderful. And a really nice guy named Mike runs it. And he shared this letter with me that he owns this letter. And it's from Marty Mann. And it's written from Blythewood. It says, in fact, that's the original right there, Blythewood Greenwich. 
And it says, Dear Mr. Amos, I am enclosing my check for $5. This is my pledge towards Bill Wilson's salary covering June 15th to July 15th. So we've talked about this, and I don't know if salary is exactly the correct word, but many people would try to chip in because, again, Bill and Lois moved 51 times, so they didn't even have a place. So I think so many people felt like we, if we must try to help sustain Bill so that he can keep working on this book. We don't want, they didn't want him to go out and get another job because if he dropped the ball on the book, what's going to happen to Alcoholics Anonymous? So again, $5, this was her contribution. Um, and it's a story for another day as to who Mr. Day, Mr. Amos is, but he worked for the Rockefellers and the Rockefellers, you know, Bill and Bob had gone to the Rockefellers to try to get help, uh, meaning financial help. But the Rockefellers helped a little bit, but ultimately turned them down saying, your greatest gift is that you're self-supporting. That is your goal. That's the goal. Stay self-supporting. That, that's the, that's the way to go. So, um, Anyway, but they did try to help. They tried to manage a few things at the beginning. Anyway, so in 1939, I'm sure Marty was still at Blythewood, but she would continue to go to meetings. And, and in one of her um, audio recordings, she talks about, um, she. well, this is her quote. I've heard her say this. She says, quote, wouldn't it be wonderful if someday we could travel across the country and find an AA meeting in every town? What grandiosity. Everybody roared with laughter. It was the biggest joke of the evening. Wow. But, you know, you see what a visionary she is. You know, and already, I mean, they always say Bill and Marty were cut from the same cloth. They were very similar. They had big, big ideas. I remember this great quote. It's from Dr. Bob's son. He went by Smitty. And he's quoted as saying, that if it was up to if it was up to Bill Wilson, so again, this is the son of Dr. Pob talking. He says, if it was up to Bill Wilson, you know, AA would have been franchised. It would have been on every corner. It would have been, you know, marketed. It would have been this. It would have been that. He goes, but if it were up to my dad, he said, it would have never left Akron, right? So you see how these two people together, they were the perfect pair because Bill just had such big ideas. He was like, yes, let's go, let's, let's, let's go wild. And Dr. Bob was so grounded and so modest and so just like, you know, very grounded. So the two of them were perfect together, in my opinion, in my opinion. Now, in 1939, Marty had a series of slips or relapses as they've been come to be called. And one night, this is from her biography. It says one night returning from a liquor store, she saw a tall, thin, pathetic figure stooped over peering at the names on the mailboxes. His trousers were shabby, jacket too small, cuffs frayed. It was Bill Wilson. She agreed to let him up as long as she could keep drinking. Later, she said she felt sorry for him. He looked so sad. After she conceded that she did want to sober it up again, Bill said, you know, you and I have a long way to go together. Now, Bill said, I have a note from Lois. We'd like you to come back with us if you'd like to. Lois's note read, we want you up here because we love you. And this is a really nice picture of Lois at Stepping Stones in 1941. Again, that's courtesy of Stepping Stones. So, you know, it's so heartwarming. And, you know, the ironic thing is the, Wilson, the, the Wilsons at this time are still homeless. So at the time they were staying at the summer cottage in the Pocono Mountains, but the thing was, it was winter, it was Christmas time. So, you know, Bill said, it's not too comfortable and we've raised the money for you to go to Towns Hospital. Now, Towns Hospital in New York, that's where Bill had his spiritual awakening. So, the, uh, so you know, these poor alcoholics who are barely keeping it together had raised the money. And Marty was so touched by that. That's this little group of New York men alcoholics had raised money, even at Christmas time, even when everyone's poor. It's during, you know, the war, World War II. And they pulled enough money so that she could go to Towns. But she said, no, she goes, I'll come with you. And Bill, Bill and Lois tapered her off over three days in this very cold cottage. So they, they detoxed her with alcohol. And the biography tells us, quote, the major factor in Marty's acceptance by the men was Bill Wilson's attitude. He and Marty hit it off immediately. 
They were cut from the same piece of cloth, both of them visionary, charismatic, open-minded, and entrepreneurial. You know, and it's so interesting because, you know, women were not always welcome, of course. But I think, you know, and then I, on one level, I kind of understand that, you know, this is at the very, very beginning, you know, and I think, you know, so many of that first 100, they were came from, from state hospitals, they came from jail, they were wrecks. These were low, low bottom, you know, these are men who are barely alive. And then, you know, sometimes the wives had concerns about women in AA. They're like, I'm sure they felt like, are you kidding me? I have been living with this man for a million years. He, he, we have lost everything. He's, you know, half dead. And, um, and now you're going to introduce women to the mix? No. But I really believe that the, the, in New York, these women could tell that Marty was not interested in their husbands. They probably they didn't understand. Probably they did not know. It's not public that she was a lesbian. But I think they could intuitively tell that she had no interest in their husbands. And this was her partner of 40 years. Marty and Priscilla Peck, again, were romantic partners. Priscilla joined AA in 1943. Now, um, Marty, this is a photo of Marty. This is them at um, Cherry Grove on Fire Island, taken in 1948. Marty is 44 on this picture. Priscilla's 41. And they actually bought a home in Cherry Grove because, again, this was a very private place where gay people could be themselves. It was just a very secluded area and a community. Now, of course, it's much more popular. And they actually sold their home. Once it became more public, once more people became aware of what was happening, they sold their home there. And they lived in, they've always had, then they moved to Greenwich Village in New York. But I'm so grateful they had this time together. I love this photo of them. And again, um, later I'll be telling you about Priscilla worked at Vogue magazine for 25 years. So you can see her very stylish uh, pleated mini skirt here. And they just look so happy and relaxed. And I'm so happy they had because they did. They lived very, very closeted lives. And so I'm glad they had this time. This is a postcard of Cherry Grove in a Fire Island. And um, the biography tells us Marty partied in Cherry Grove during her drinking days. Cherry Grove was also frequented by famous artists such as Tennessee Williams, Truman Capote, Paul and Jane Bowles, Carson McCullers, and W.H. Auden. My friend Lori, who I mentioned earlier, who I interviewed, who now has 55 years of sobriety, told me, Marty had a coterie of very famous gay people around her in New York. They went to Fire Island, but they lived very closeted lives. It was not public knowledge. We knew she was gay, and there were probably some straight friends that were sworn to silence. Here's another postcard from Cherry Grove during that era. And it says, the biography tells us, quote, both women were well-known in Cherry Grove as lesbians and as recovered alcoholics. Quote, Call Marty became a standard SOS among some of America's most famous art, literary, and theater names. This is a map that shows where the very first Cherry Grove AA group started. Marty helped to start that. Now, this is a slide of the Countess Felicia G. Her story is in the big book, and it's called Stars Don't Fall. And, um, and Marty was Felicia's sponsor. And um, um, Bill Wilson refers to Felicia as a six woman in AA. And it's very interesting. I would encourage you to read Felicia's story. Again, stars don't fall. It says, quote, Priscilla, an AA who, like Marty, had become one of my greatest friends, decided that I was a stubborn case. So, you know, uh, it, this is so fascinating to me because not very many people have their names in the big book. And yet here we have Priscilla and Marty in the same sentence. And Felicia is talking about coming to their home, about how they helped her. And it's a whole long, interesting story. Um, so, uh, yeah, Felicia is a very interesting person. And she was a countess, very interesting in her own right. Now, this photo here, this is actually Priscilla's sister. Priscilla had one sibling. She was also a lesbian and also an alcoholic. Now, Liz had a master's in physical education and was an, a World War II flying instructor. She taught for the, in the Army, Navy, and Marines, the pilots. I gave this talk in Hawaii where they have a lot of military people, and one of the fellows told me that the Air Force hadn't been organized at that point in 1943. So she was essentially helping to teach every branch of the American service. 
And unfortunately, um, uh, Priscilla and Les and Marty, they weren't very close. They, they had a stressful relationship because uh, Liz had trouble being discreet because of her alcoholism. You know, she was drinking, she was dating women. And again, this is the 1940s. And it made Marty and Priscilla very uncomfortable because of her lack of discretion. So um, that they, they kind of kept their distance in some ways. Now, this is a great picture of Marty. I think it really captures her personality. Now, this is a quote by Walter M. He was a executive of the National Council on Alcoholism. I had the good fortune of interviewing his, his widow, Debbie, who knew Marty very well. And this and Walter and Debbie loved Marty very much. But Walter is quoted as saying, Marty had an ego and a will the size of Mount Everest. But Marty's ego was without arrogance. She would drop everything to lend a hand to any alcoholic seeking her help. My friend Lori quoted, quote, Marty would go to any length to help an alcoholic. Back in the day, you detox people on your couch. The treatment center was your couch. That was the era and Marty would drop anything because she knew the likelihood of our dying was incredible. Marty got into the trenches. All of her social class stuff fell away. If there was a skid row person, they were, they were as deserving of her time as a socialite. That was the passion. That's what she meant when she talked about carrying the message. Now, um, I'm going to, you know, Marty creates a National Council on Alcoholism in 1944, but I'm going to, just to let you know, the NCEA, the NCA, and the NCADD are all the exact same organization. They just had different names over the years. So it went from the National Committee for Education on Alcoholism to the National Council on Alcoholism to the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence. That was after Marty passed. So I'm um, again, same organization, different names, and Marty was the founder. This is a great uh, photo of Rosie the Riveters. And um, the headline of this newspaper article says, War Wives Turn to Drink, Woman Ex-Alcoholic Says. And this is in 1944. And then this is a photo of Marty with two men. And she's age 42 at the Detroit Economic Club. And Marty's wearing a very fancy big hat. And um, my friend Lori says, quote, if you had ever met Marty in person, she had a capacity to command with her physical presence before she had even opened her mouth. She was tall, she was impeccably dressed, and she had splendid, splendid taste. Marty spoke 200 times per year on behalf of the National Council to provide education, information, and referrals for their respective communities. Most of the funding for the affiliates came from local private donations. You know, the other thing to keep in mind is Marty is speaking at these private clubs where women weren't even allowed to be members, right? She'd be the only woman there in the room and she'd be the speaker. Now, the National Council also had an advisory board. Famous people like actress Mary Pickford from the silent era was uh, movie era was uh, one of the members and then author Dorothy Parker. And throughout the talk, you're gonna just see all these webs, all these interconnections. So author Dorothy Parker. Well, both these women very well known in their own right and had some interest in alcoholism. And um, so, but Dorothy Parker wrote the story of the woman alcoholic. And this is in 1947, it's called Smash Up. A friend of mine recently saw it on TV. So you could still out there. And Marty was hired because again, she's a friend of Dorothy Parker to be the consultant to Susan Hayward. So Marty went out to Hollywood for two weeks and was a consultant on this movie, Smash Up. This is a nice photo, Marty and Bill. And you know, the biography tells us that Marty possessed a drive which Bill immediately spotted as equal to his own. And here's one of the original grapevine um, masthead. And you know who drew those little grapes? That would be Priscilla, Marty's partner. In 1944, Marty and Priscilla worked with four other AA members to create the Grapevine magazine. So Marty and Priscilla were founders, co-founders of the Grapevine magazine. Then the grapevine became the primary way AA communicated with members across the United States and overseas during World War II. And if you're not familiar with the grapevine, boy, have I got a treat for you. Their website is aagrapevine.org. You know, and how amazing that Marty and Priscilla were there right from the beginning. 
Um, she's uh, referenced as being the editor at some one point. And that's the case I like to make is that Priscilla is not, is, is relevant, is highly relevant to AA history and not just because of her long-term relationship with Marty. This is a cover that, uh, that Priscilla did for House and Garden Magazine. And both Marty and Priscilla also worked for Town and Country Magazine. So they brought quite a bit of professional mag magazine experience to our AA grapevine. And then here's a nice quote. In 1945, it's from a New Jersey newspaper. And Marty's talking about the challenges of women joining AA. And it says, it hasn't been easy for us to reach them. And it hasn't been easy for them to reach out to us, but it is getting easier all the time. We women are making it so, right? We women are making it so. And that's exactly how AA works, right? One woman reaching out to another, one person reaching out to another. Now, what about the 11th tradition? The 11th tradition tells us, quote, our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. Well, that's interesting because Marty is running around the, the entire country uh, talking about alcoholism and also talking about our own alcoholism. But what I like to point out is that Marty, um, these, these traditions weren't born overnight. The, the, uh, these traditions actually, the, the 12 and 12 wasn't published until 1953. And Marty started in 1944. The, uh, they were published one by one in the grapevine. That's how people learned about the traditions. Each month, Bill would write about one, one more tradition until he got to 12. And then in 1950, they were adopted at the first international convention. So, um, you know, so there's, there was definitely controversy. And I think sometimes people judge Marty because they think she broke her anonymity and this and that. But my friend Debbie, the woman who is the widow of um, um, the fellow at the, um, oh, Walter, I'm sorry, uh, uh, the National Council said that, um, that back then they talked about it being, being a two hatter. You like, you wore your AA hat and then you wore your hat as being an advocate. And that there were many interesting caveats where Bill and Dr. Bob also had their names on the letterhead of the National Council in the beginning. And that leads us to tradition six, where it says an AA group I'd never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name. And back then, Bill and Bob were kind of considered the AA name, even though they were people. They, you know, they Bill and Bob actually turned over AA to the group. That actually happened in one of the conventions. But at the beginning, they were so closely associated with the with AA itself, of course. Anyway, so um, and it says um, less problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. But this is how AA learned. You know, we did not arrive fully formed. So I think it's important um, to explain that about Marty and her travels and. Um, so this is a 1946 grapevine. It says, alcoholic vets may get help. The Veterans Administration is considering offering care to alcoholics in its hospitals, Mrs. Marty Mann, Executive Sec Secretary of the NCA, NCEA said here. VA officials have been giving serious study to plans proposed by the National Committee and have expressed a favorable reaction. So that's really amazing to think that, I mean, that Marty and the National Council was instrumental in the Veterans Administration deciding to help treat alcoholics within the military. <clears throat> this is an interesting uh, Pan Am World Airways Air Passenger Manifest, and I found both their names. This I actually found on um, Ancestry uh, Family Tree. And uh, this is a Pan Am passenger list from Bahamas to Miami. And it's very likely that they were visiting their friend, this person named Joe Carstairs. Now, Joe was born a woman. Uh, how she would identify today, I'm not sure, but a very, very interesting person. She, or I'll just call Joe Joe, uh, Joe um, was heir to the Standard Oil fortune. And they became friends in Europe, very, very, very wealthy. And that so um, Marty and Priscilla and other of their friends would go to socialize. And I think that was another opportunity where um, as a lesbian couple, they could be you know, relax and not be afraid of being outed. There was tremendous fear about being known to be gay back then. 
And this is a close up of the passenger list. It has there, they have a shared address at 15th East 48th Street. I went by there recently. And uh, their ages, their genders, their marital status, and where they were born. And this is, I like this little, it's like a classified ad. And um, it's from upstate New York. And it says, have you a drinking problem? Is there a drinking problem in your family? Here, Marty Mann, first woman member of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> so that's a funny thing, speaking of anonymity. But um, but it's interesting. You know, one thing I like to say is, you know, Marty's life was not all glamour. She went to every single state of the United States. And I mean, in the newspaper research I've done, I see, you know, these advertisements for, you know, coming on this week, you know, Marty Mann, female alcoholic, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, she traveled nonstop. And like I said, she spoke 200 times a year, but it wasn't just like, the West Coast and East Coast. She went absolutely everywhere, everywhere. And this is a good example because this is a Monday night in upstate New York in Binghamton, New York. And, you know, really based on all I know about Marty, do I think she really wanted to go be speaking in a high school auditorium on a Monday night at 8 p.m.? No, I do not. I do not think that's her idea of a good time. But that's just how hard she worked. She was a tremendously hard worker and she was so devoted to carrying the message. You know, not just in a superficial way, but in a very incredibly hardworking. And, um, you know, sometimes you'll hear old timers, they say, they say, if, it, if it's convenient, then it's not service. <laughs> Here's a couple of Vogue magazine covers. A biography says, quote, Priscilla Starr was about to rise in spectacular tandem to Marty's. In 1947, she began working as an art editor at Vogue and remained 25 years until her retirement in 1972. So I chose these two covers just to demonstrate the incredible changes in fashion between 47 and 72. Really, it's just amazing to think all that Priscilla must have witnessed being the art editor at Vogue. It's very prestigious. And this is a picture of Priscilla in the office at Vogue. And this is a cover that she created. That's her drawing. Usually, of course, they have supermodels on the cover, but that's a copy. That's a photo. I mean, I'm sorry. This is a drawing that Priscilla did. And I think it's highlighting this coat in the country. Yeah. Now, again, here's a picture of Priscilla and in 1946. And in the next slide, I'm going to be showing you a video. So you're going to actually be able to see Priscilla in action. In the video, she's wearing a black suit, a white blouse, and a black hat. The world still looks to Paris, despite its temporary eclipse during the war, as the historic source of creative fashion. But though a Paris label still carries great prestige, big names in the world of fashion have emerged across the Atlantic. The editors of fashion magazines like Vogue play an important part. Constantly on the alert for fashion trends, these magazines select for illustration the clothes and accessories they consider most significant. Photographed by specialists like Horst. So Priscilla um, was very knowledgeable about art. And in 1949, they bought a Jackson Pollock, number 15. And the reason I tell you this is that Marty actually had to sell this painting in 1979 in order to pay for the care Priscilla would require at the end of her life. It was sold to a private buyer from Europe who remains unknown. And the price is unknown. However, one year after Marty sold hers, Christie's auction house set a record for one of his paintings being sold for $550,000, which is even a, a lot more in 1979 or 1980 as it, as it would be today. So they were very knowledgeable. And Jackson Pollock's also very interesting. He had a tragic death related to alcoholism. So I'm sure that they tried to carry the message to him as well. They also bought a Mark Rothko painting and, um, and, uh, and, all these people are very interesting. In the middle is Betty Parsons. There's a lot said about her. She was also a lesbian. They were good friends with Marty. She was good friends with Marty and Priscilla. And um, again, they lived in Greenwich Village in New York. And after 70 years, 70 years later, uh, a similar painting would sell up an auction up to $75 million. So clearly these, they, the, their knowledge about art was quite remarkable. 
So Eleanor Roosevelt also call, called Marty. This was one of my favorite things. Uh, the National Council had boxes that would appear in bars and liquor stores to collect people's nickels and dimes. And on the boxes, a sign would read, you can drink, help the alcoholic who can't. Alcoholism is a disease. And, and Eleanor Roosevelt said, impressed by this strange fact, I talked today to the vice president and executive director of the organization, Mrs. Marty Mann. Now, this is taken from a daily column Eleanor Roosevelt wrote. And I'm not sure if everyone knows, but Eleanor Roosevelt was a first lady. And this was after her husband, uh, after they left the White House. She, she wrote this daily column. And, um, and the other thing that's interesting about this is so clever is that, you know, again, these boxes are in bars and liquor stores. Where do alcoholics go? They go to bars and liquor stores, right? So it's also just this little box is also carrying the message to the still drinking alcoholic. And, but it's saying alcoholism is a disease. And that's her message over and over and over. That is Marty's main message. It's a disease and to fight the stigma associated with it. This is Marty's very first book. It's called Primer on Alcoholism. And uh, this photo is her at home in New York City. And it's written, the book was written in 1950 and she's now 46 years old. My friend Lori says, quote, Marty was very confrontive. Dare not ever talk about a drunk. It was alcoholism, alcoholism, the illness, alcoholism, the disease. You do not use pejorative words. You use the right word. She was on a mission to teach people about the illness. And these were really radical ideas back then. I mean, now today, you know, people think, ah, whatever. No, back then it was a radical, radical idea. The thought that alcoholism is a disease. Amazing. I, this, I think this is really special. In 1951, Marty was invited to South Africa to speak at its first national conference on alcoholism. She spent six weeks and visited 13 cities, helping local groups plan how to address the issue of alcoholism, start NCI type organizations. And in the 1960s, a grapevine story tells us, quote, and there comfortably serene sat AAs and friends of all races, without regard to South Africa's strict enforcement of racial separation. United by multiple bonds forged over the intervening 19 years through unremitting 12-stepping. That's amazing. I mean, I, I'm, I'm almost 60 years old this summer and I remember apartheid certainly. And I remember, you know, I mean, it was such a profound split and yet there in AA, there we are all together sitting there. That's beautiful. And Marty, I suspect, was instrumental in helping AA, you know, um, help get, at least to at least carry the message, you know. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, it's interesting. Uh, and like all around the world, I, mean, I have a little note to myself that says in South Africa, AA had been started by a quote, Johnny Appleseed a traveling businessman who continued to relapse, but started AA and spread the word about AA as he traveled and continued to try to get sober. Amazing. So this is Marty's second book, and this is a copy I was able to obtain, her autographed version, Warm Regards. And um, yeah. now this, this is her third book, Marty Man Answers Your Questions About Drinking and Alcoholism. This is another autographed copy. And this is quite remarkable. Um, during the 1950s and well into the 1960s, hospitals generally didn't admit drunk patients, even for detox. Twice, Marty had the horrifying experience of individuals dying in taxi cabs with her because hospitals refused admission, saying they only cared for sick people. Biography states, quote, she was like a train barreling down the tracks jump on or get out of the way. Now the next slide is a newsreel. So you're actually gonna be able to hear Marty Mann talking in this video. It's during World War II, 1945. And remember, she's only four years sober. This is amazing, four years sober. And back then during World War II, the way Americans found out about the news, what's going on, is there'd be newsreel before the big movies in the theaters, not, te not television. And so they, she, she had this newsreel and, and you're gonna see it right now. Alcoholism has too long been a taboo subject, just as tuberculosis used to be 40 years ago. 
We're trying to teach people the truth, that alcoholism is a disease, and that because it is a disease, it should have no stigma attached to it. Marty Mann was doing recovery advocacy for many, many decades, and uh, she was Bill Wilson's sponsee. Uh, she had Bill Wilson's blessing in doing the work she was doing, uh, educating communities about the realities of alcoholism, and had really sort of set the stage for a lot of recovery advocacy that happened a few decades later. Marty got sober after a just horrendous time with alcohol and not understanding it was a disease. And she began traveling around the country with Dr. Bob and Bill W. And she experienced a stigma, no programs, no services for alcoholics and their families. And she said, this is terrible. We need to do something about it. And Bill and Dr. Bob said, we can't, but you can. Alcoholics should be dealt with like other sick persons, in hospitals and clinics, not in jails. Alcoholism, America's fourth greatest public health problem, can be solved by community action. The National Committee stands ready to help your community plan such action. This is quite remarkable. And this is the context that she was doing all of this work. In 1950s in the United States, we had McCarthyism and homophobia was at an all time high. In 1947, the State Department begins firing suspected homosexuals under President Truman's National Security Loyalty Program. By 1955, anti-gay witch hunts cost more than 1,200 men and women their jobs with the federal government. And these are just a handful of, of, of um, headlines I was able to find. I mean, they were just, every single day, this was the type of thing that Marty and Priscilla would be reading in the paper. How the Reds blackmail homosexuals into spying for them. Senate group approved sexual perverts probe. 400 more homosexuals ousted from government jobs. Senate to I lavender list. Perverts called government peril. So you can see exactly why she would be closeted. Now, Barry Leach, Barry L. There's also a wonderful presentation being done about him recently. And he was a gay man. He is also the author of the book, Living Sober, the AA official book, Living Sober. Um, he um, lived in New York. He was good friends with Marty and Priscilla. And um, his partner would later die of HIV AIDS in the 1980s and Barry would die a few years later. But there are some wonderful recordings of Barry. I have a bibliography I'm happy to share with people. If you'd like to email me, I'll be putting the email at the end. But um, it's um, Marty and Miley at gmail.com. But anyway, uh, it has many of these recordings and you can hear Barry L say this. He says, quote, we were not just closeted. We were in a vault holding on to each other's hands desperately. We recognized each other, of course. And by the way, Bill knew us all too. It never bothered Bill. And I think that's so important, you know, especially for newcomers, for LGBT people, LGBTQ people who are wondering whether or not they belong in AA, whether AA is a place for them. You know, just knowing that that from the very beginning, there have been LGBTQ people there from the very beginning that Bill Wilson knew and it never bothered Bill, you know, and that leads us to tradition three. And it says, quote, at last experience taught us that to take away any alcoholic's full chance was sometimes to pronounce his death sentence and often to condemn him to endless misery. Who dared to be judge and jury and executioner of his own sick brother, right? Or sister, as the case may be. Tradition three is specifically, the, the roots of tradition three is related to homosexuality. And there's a lot written on that, but um, what a blessing. What a blessing for, for Bill and progressive minds. Mm. And my friend Lori states, quote, Marty said it was her mission to carry the message about alcoholism, and it was our generation's job to carry the message about homosexuality, unquote. Quote, I don't think she had internalized homophobia. Marty was fine with who she was. She was realistic and realistically fearful. The silence wasn't because she had shame about being a lesbian. The silence was because she knew there was danger, both professionally and in those days physically. Back in the day, one of the ways they could have rendered her and her message impotent was to gay bash. 
Now, the biography tells us that Marty temporarily lost her bearings with Carson McCullers, the author of The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. And that is an amazing euphemism for having an affair. She temporarily lost her, her, her bearings. Carson McCullers is a very well-known author. She wrote The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. She was one of the people listed as a type of person that would be a cherry grove. In fact, this is, Mart, is a photo of Marty and Carson McCullers at Pat's Restaurant in Cherry Grove. And uh, Carson would die in 1967. And both Marty and Priscilla are mentioned in Carson's biography. And um, yeah, Marty would then on, go on to have a relationship, a lengthy affair with Jane Bowles, an American writer and playwright. Now Jane, uh, Jane is identified as a lesbian and she married her bisexual husband, Paul Bowles at age 21. So that's a perfect example of a man and woman coming together, knowing that, oh, I'm a lesbian, I'm bisexual, okay, let's get married. That was very common. And, um, and sadly, Jane Bowles died and it tragically, she was unable to get sober. There's a book called My Sister's Hand and Mine, uh, the collected work of Jane Bowles and Marty's name is mentioned in that book also as an affair. And this is a photo of them poolside in Beverly Hills. But thank God for Priscilla. This is a wonderful love letter written to Marty from Priscilla. It's in Marty's archives. And it says, darling, I love you up, down, in, out, now, then, forever. No sea, sky, land bog, flotsam, jetsam, or whatnot can harm or separate us. All, all, all love, P. And then she says, love and kisses to Bunny the hero and Taffy. Now, I suspect one of these dogs is Bunny and the other one is Taffy. This is a photo taken in their Greenwich Village apartment. And I really love the person closest to us in the photo. That is Marty's mother. So clearly, Marty's mother knew all about this relationship. She was a close part of the family. And then in the, okay, so front left side, that's Marty's mother. Next person, that's Priscilla in the back holding the other dog. Next person sort of in the middle, that's LeClaire Bissell, a very interesting person in a history, also a lesbian. And um, I believe the biography tells that she actually was involved with Liz, uh, Priscilla's sister for a while. And then there's Marty on the right. And uh, I just keep learning more and more amazing facts about Marty. This is the kind of thing where honestly, it's hard to believe, but apparently it's true. Uh, while in Rome, Marty had a private audience with the Pope. And um, this is in 1956, and it says, um, quote, the Holy Father blessed the works of the National Committee, commented that it was, quote, one of the, of the first importance and further blessed Mrs. Mann and all who worked with her. A further conference with Bishop O'Connor indicated that this event would have far reaching consequences in the cooperation of the Catholic Church with the modern approaches to alcoholism symbolized by the NCA. And so just, you know, it's one of those things where it's just incredible how Marty traveled, how she connected with people. She was quite gifted. Now, despite her amazing life, Marty did relapse in 1959. She was age 55. And it's an interesting story. The biography tells us that a young woman who idolized Marty visited her apartment to meet her. And there she found Marty was intoxicated. The apartment was a mess. The dogs needed attention. And, uh, and the young, well, young and, and Priscilla was nowhere to be found. And the young woman piled Marty and the dogs into her car, um, brought her back to her apartment. Hopefully she called her sponsor. And uh, Marty did refuse to go to AA meetings at that time. And uh, little by little, she got it back together. Now, um, it says, quote, what precipitated the drinking is unknown, but the accumulating stressors of her work, her health, her guilt about Jane Bowles in particular, the long illness of her mother and the deaths of her parents would be danger signals for the ordinary recovering alcoholic. And, you know, that's exactly what Marty was. You know, I mean, her life was so remarkable. Sometimes it's maybe easy to forget that she is exactly the ordinary recovering alcoholic. You know, she's a garden variety, right? She was a real alcoholic. And, um, you know, she had, she'd come so far from her days in the mental institution. But um, now this is a Reader's Digest from 1963. It says, what the alcoholic owes to Marty Mann. And it's so true. And, why, and it's so interesting. We don't really know much about Marty, right? Until recently, you know, we don't hear much about her. And um, I think that's partly because of the relapse, you know, I think maybe she lost some credibility. She did stay sober the rest of her life. She did stay with Priscilla the rest of her life. And, um, but 
I don't know. I'm not sure. And of course, maybe because she's a lesbian, I'm not sure. And um, in the grapevine, Marty wrote in 1968, she wrote, always to me, meetings have been important. The feeling of warmth, of love and understanding of acceptance and belonging that I get at a meeting is to me one of the great rewards of being an AA. So she continued and she and even they moved to Connecticut in their later years um, and she started meetings there, too. So she was always active in AA. In 1969, she and Bill spoke to a U.S. Uh, Senate subcommittee. She said, I had discovered the strength of the stigma that lay on alcoholism. I discovered the conspiracy of silence that existed about it. You know, I think back to her sitting in Hyde Park all day drinking, about that crazy trip home on the Queen Mary, being a charity patient at psych hospitals. And here she is testifying before the Senate with Bill Wilson. This photo is of Marty and Priscilla in 1970. And they're actually at Felicia G's home in this photo. It's interesting. Felicia G is the countess, the woman who wrote about Priscilla and Marty in her big book story. And um, um, so it says uh, in the grapevine, uh, she says, um, the 12 steps have given me a glimpse at something I had never known, a peace of mind, a sense of being comfortable with myself and with the world in which I lived, a sense of growth, both emotional and spiritual. And then and, um, she went on also to be in this TV show uh, back in the day to tell the truth, the original. I remember seeing that when I was a kid, the reruns. It said um, she was introduced with two male contestants and they all claimed to be Marty Mann, the founder of the National Council on Alcoholism. Then they would all take turns standing. Of course, no one guessed that it was the woman. And they were quite astounded when this poised, articulate, dignified woman uh, stood up and said, yes, I'm an alcoholic in recovery and the founder of the NCA. This was an interesting um, event, uh, not a, a event. It was by the National Council and it was um, Operation Understanding. And it was very interesting. They would go in us, they went row by row as alphabetical and each person stood, announced his or her name and then added, I am an alcoholic. And they were actors, politicians, journalists, sports figures, people like Dick Van Dyke, the TV star, Buzz Aldrin, astronaut. Don Newcomb, African-American, major league pitcher. And then very interesting, Gary Moore, the beloved host of To Tell the Truth, right? From the previous slide, that's how Marty got invited to tell the truth because Gary Moore here, and he's standing up saying, I am an alcoholic. And I, and I heard from people that were there that, that when Marty introduced herself, everybody else stood up. They gave her a standing ovation, including the media that was present. They all stood up, you know? And here's the big question, is Marty Mann really the first lady of AA? So Florence R. Is, has her story in the first edition of the big book, and her story is called A Feminine Victory. Now, she went, would, would go on to relapse, and then she would die at, in 1943 at age 47. Then there's Sylvia K. She got sober in 1939. Um, and uh, after Marty, and, but she had um, continuous sobriety. Her story is the keys to the kingdom and it's in the second edition of the big book. She was an heiress from Chicago and she died in 1974 with 35 years. Then there's Sybil C. She's often called the first woman west of the Mississippi. And she's very popular out here on the West Coast. And her date of sobriety was March 21st, 1941. And, um, she is, if you ever have an opportunity to find one of her recordings, she's really a kick in the pants. I think you'd enjoy it. Then there's Ethel M. Boy, people in love in Akron, Ohio, love her. That's where Dr. Bob was. And she stayed sober her entire life. She wrote the book From Farm to City, second edition of the big book. And um, I want to go back briefly to say about um, Sybil. Uh, uh, no, 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 right. Sybil did not write anything for the big book. Okay. Sylvia wrote Keys to the Kingdom, okay? Just, just in case you wanna track that. Florence wrote A Feminine Victory. Sylvia wrote Keys to the Kingdom. Sybil did not write anything. Ethel in Akron wrote From Farm to City. And, um, and you know, the thing is, and then there's Marty, right? And again, her story's in the second edition. So there's also another woman in Akron called um, Jane Sturdivant, and her name is on a list written by Dr. Bob. And it was a list that they presented to the Rockefellers to demonstrate, hey, here's a list of people we're helping. And there's one woman's name, um, 
Jane Sturdivant. She's listed as a housewife, I believe. And um, so there's her name. So where she would land in the dates, I don't know, but I am, I don't know. So the thing is, is that I really honor all these women. You know, these women, for those of you that aren't familiar with the United States, United States is enormous. I mean, you know, 3,000 miles between New York and California. And I mean, all of these women were on their own, whether it be Chicago, Akron, West Coast, New York. They were the only one in their community. And to me, that's very much like being the first woman in AA, you know. But the thing is, is that only Florence R. has her story in the first edition. And I don't think that a person loses points or it doesn't deny her her place in history, in my opinion. You know, whether she relapsed, whether she died uh, as a result of her drinking, to me, her story still is a tremendous help, the, the story of feminine victory. And Marty was still in the mental institution reading that story. So, um, to me, I would, if I had to choose, I would say it's Florence R. But again, I honestly really honor all of them. You know, I just imagine, I mean, really, I could just cry looking at these this pictures of them, you know, and to think that there they were, they're on their own, trying to make their way, trying to belong, trying to get sober. You know, these are all just really remarkable women. I also would like to say, that there are many women, whether they be African-American women, Latino women, Native women, whatever, you know, there are so many different people out there in the world that we don't know about. Um, so I really, I just want to say I honor all of them. I honor all of them. And here's Marty and Bill W. I love this photo of them together. Bill dies in 1971. And here they are really near the end of their lives. You know, and the thing is very point poignant to me that, you know, they had a relationship of over 30 years after meeting in his home in Brooklyn, him visiting, you know, her at Blythewood Sanitarium and all they went through during all those years. Marty last spoke in July of 1980 at the International AA Convention in New Orleans. I'm going to uh, play a very brief recording. It might be difficult to hear. I'll repeat part, parts of it. She died three weeks after this talk. And it says, Marty rose from the wheelchair and walked slowly to the podium as a prolonged ovation shook the rafters. Talk about crying. <laughs> it's pretty hard to find my voice even looking around this room. I can't tell you what it feels like to be a great, 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 great grandmother to so many women. <laughs> because that's what you are, all of you. You're my children, and I'm so, so proud of you. Mm. So the beginning, she says, talk about crying. That it's hard to find my voice. She says, you know, can't tell you what it's like to look out and see so many of my great, great, great grandchildren or grand, you know, when she says, you're my children. I'm so proud of you. You know, and Marty died three weeks later, July 22nd, 1980, at the age of 75. And I'll bet, you know, I know many people who are still sober, still alive, who were there in 1980. You know, I got sober in 1984. And um, I certainly always welcome if anyone attended that, who heard her, who had anything they'd like to share with me, I'd certainly like to learn more. Talk about crying. Sorry. And this is, um, I went back east in uh, December. On the left, this is uh, New York, St. Bart's. That's her. She had two memorial services, one in New York, one in Connecticut. The one on the left is in St. Bart's. I took that photo. I left my 37-year chip there. Then on the right is in Connecticut, the first congregational. And um, it was also a great pleasure to visit there as well. And Priscilla outlived Marty by two years. Um, Marty's brother watched over her and tried to bury their ashes together. But the cemetery would not allow it because they weren't considered family. After 40 years, they were not considered family. 
Marty had her obituary in, in the New York Times, which was very prestigious, but Priscilla was not mentioned. But you know who was mentioned? Her husband of three months. Remember that guy I told you about like an hour ago? <laughs> yeah, the fellow who she eloped and then she went off three months. His name is in the obituary. And this is exactly how lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people are erased from history. Because if I didn't know better and I wanted to learn more about Marty Mann, I'd probably start by looking at the obituary. That'd be a good place to start, right? But there's no mention about anything, right? And, um, and I looked, believe me, I looked. I read every single obituary. And I also looked for Priscilla's obituaries, but there was none. It's the only thing I could find on Priscilla. It's a death notice. It says age 73, has their address in Connecticut. And it says retired art director, Vogue magazine, sister of Elizabeth Peck, funeral services and internment private. Now there's really not much we can do about the past, but, um, but I, you could do a little bit about the future. And so I did rewrite her Wikipedia page and I still wanna do more work on it. It's not perfect, but I did add Priscilla. I did add quite a bit. I added Barbara Kersimer. I just added more about her real life based on this biography. And um, you know, sometimes people have suggested that maybe it's like, well, why is this even important? Why are you even talking about it? Or maybe Marty wouldn't really want people to know about this. But you know, the thing is, is that you don't leave all of your private papers in an archive for people like me to find if you don't want people to know. That's exactly why people put things in archives is, you know, she just couldn't do it in her lifetime, you know, but she doesn't want to disappear, nor did Priscilla, you know, so thank goodness for archives. So I want to thank everyone. So many people have been helpful and, um, I want to thank all of you today, but so many people have helped me with this, including the AA Grapevine Magazine. I've done the Aloha Roundup, the family of Sally, Sally and David Brown, recoveryspeakers.com, the San Antonio Roundup, San Jose Sober and Free, San Francisco A Central Office, Stepping Stones Historic Home of Bill and Lois Wilson, the Tate Modern in London, the Vogue Magazine, UK Angel Meeting, and then the Western Roundup Living Sober. So thank you so much. This is my email on the bottom. If you would like me to email you the bibliography, it has all the different places I've told you about, meaning like all the different books and audio recordings and things like that. I'm very happy to share that with you. Uh, my email again is martyandmiley at gmail.com. Miley is spelled M-I-L-Y. So it's M-A-R-T-Y-A-N-D-M-I-L-Y at gmail.com. So I also want to let you know, this is an event that's coming up. Um, I, this group has sponsored me and, and does a lot of my, I do this presentation around once a month, maybe, and they're fantastic. And if you want to find out about, they, they do a lot of LGBT AA global speakers. This one's coming up April 30th, but you can email them for more information. It's called, um, their email is for the letter four W A A group at gmail.com. And they're terrific. So I'm going to go ahead and end the show. I thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Wow. Wow. Just amazing. Thank you so much. That was thank so you. Good. My Mom, pleasure. Would you, um, would you be able to field a few questions or do you need to sure. get back to work? No, I can speak for a little while. That'd be fine. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, um, and I'm, I see Joe C's back. And if anyone's got any questions, uh, could you raise your hand and uh, I'll put you across. I just wonder, um, there's so much in that. And um, I'm astounded. Really. I didn't realize that I didn't know that story. I'd heard bits and pieces, but it was great the way you put it together. I just uh, what would what do you think that Marty would think of AA today? And particularly with reference to what how AA works with with women or the and do you think would she be happy with the way AA is today? Would she recognize AA? And would she be do you think she'd be would she praise where we are at the moment with 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 recovery around the world? Honestly, I think she would. I think she'd be amazed. I mean, you know, she lived in 1980. So again, I mean, a was pretty progressive. By the time I arrived in 1984, at least in San Francisco, things were, you know, felt pretty good. Um 
but I, I think she'd be amazed. I think she'd be amazed still at just how it's continued to grow. And then the fact that there is just such a gigantic LGBTQ community and how, how really welcome we've become throughout, um, you know, I would say Alcoholics Anonymous. And again, AA is very regional. So, you know, if you're in a different state, if you're in a different country, if you're in a different part of the country, that experience is going to be different. Now, you have to remember, I'm in San Francisco, California, which is a very, uh, you know, wonderful place to be. That's why I live here. Um, so, again, I think she, at least based on my experience, I think she'd be pretty pleased. And for women in general, I think she'd be quite, quite amazed. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Jill, do you want to come in? Yeah, you know, I'm, I wonder how long have you been gathering research? When did you start? What lit your fire? How did you find out about her? Fire Island or the story or what happened? Right. I'm glad you asked. Well, really, my my sponsor, who is Ruth S., and she has, um, gosh, I want to say at least, I think we want to say 56 years of sobriety. I've been with her all along. She and I have been together the entire 37 years. And she's so she's really been so special to me and really like a parent in some ways. I mean, just wonderful. But anyway, so as soon as this book was published, she read it, of course. And she was, um, Miley, you should read the book. I'm like, oh, no, yeah, whatever. I just, you know, was that type person. I just was like, oh, okay. But I never read it. I didn't read it. I didn't read it. She told me about it like 10 or 20 times. I didn't read it. Then it was a classic situation where um, I finally read it. I'm like, oh my God, that's amazing. You know? And so that's how I was really, and she was like, I tried to tell you this. And so then um, in San Francisco central office, I was invited. They were just going to do a, a regular thing about women and AA. And so uh, they asked me if I would just, you know, do about Marty. And I said, well, sure, I'd love to, that'd be great. And so I just did put together a very small, much smaller PowerPoint and it was well received. And so then I did it for living sober, which is our LGBTQ conference here in San Francisco, which is where I got sober also. It's wonderful. And um, anyway, and then I just kept doing it and people, and then, and then once it was really a blessing of Zoom, of course, where then I was invited, I think, to do it online at Living Sober one year. This has all just been in the last five years, I'd say. And then San Antonio, Texas asked me. And from there, these women who I mentioned from that 4AA, that, that group, the email I gave at the end, they saw me on Zoom and they're like, oh, hold your horses. We need to take this on the road. We need, uh, we, 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 and then they organized this whole thing. And um, they are just quite wonderful, uh, Ginny and Kim and Linda. And they now do things where I speak and then they find some other speakers to join me. So it's like a nice morning. And we did that all through the pandemic, um, you know, where we, you know, we'd have these things. And the beautiful thing is that, you know, people from the middle of the United States, from all over the world, but also people that are in small towns, also older people, um, it really, it was very nice, you know, for people maybe who could really identify with Marty, people who are still closeted, um, you know, whatever. It was just very amazing for them to hear like, wow, there's a place for me in AA, you know, or that I'm welcome here. And that also to feel really proud about this person. And, you know, they always talk about AA being a program of identification. And that's another reason why I think it's so important for people to be able to feel this pride and to feel this sense of like, wow, I can't believe it. She was someone like me, you know, and I think that was really, really nice. Yeah. And I just want to tell you that those quips about Bill Wilson are so poignant. I'm telling you, I, I almost lose it every time that description of him standing by the, the mailboxes yes. and how ragged he was, you know, how much they sacrificed, you know, mm. I mean, just like what they gave up yeah. for us to be here today. It always just kills me. I love it. Thank you so much. Mom. Yes. I love you too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jill. Um, I see Joe C's walking through the the, the, the airport there and Hi Joe. Hi how you doing? Good I'm great, thank you. you. Yeah, anybody who's listening to this on a podcast, uh, you need to see it to believe it. And <laughs> it would be a great idea for you to follow that email address and get a chance to see it again. Or uh, book Miley. She's fun <laughs> to have around, as you can hear. Uh, I, yeah, sorry, I wasn't here right from the beginning, uh, but uh, what a great 
in an important bit of uh, research uh, uh, you've done. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Safe travels. <laughs> Thank you. Is this going to be available um, on YouTube, oh, David? Audios, audio only. It will be oh, available. Okay, yep. We're going to okay. strip the video off and uh, just have the have the audio. Um, another question: um, When she was doing her two hundred talks per year and going around to every state, which is an amazing feat, and all yeah. the people that she met along, you know, like Amelia Earhart and stuff like that, it's just uh, <laughs> Jackson Pollock. It's 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 yeah. She's definitely a part of history. What was the format of her talks going around? Do you, do, have you ever heard them? I'm, I'm intrigued to know how long she spoke. That's for. so interesting. I've only heard her AA talks, and there's several recordings and links to the recordings. I think, but there must be. I'm sure there are many recordings of her. But I think the main thing was that there is a solution. Um, that she has experienced a solution and that it is an illness and that the stigma is killing people, that type of thing. And, you know, in that, uh, that video recording where she talks about that people need treatment, not jails. I mean, that's still a radical idea today, almost, you know, that, mm. that this is a disease. I mean, so that was really, um, I think that was the essence was really focusing on the stigma, the disease, and that there is a solution and that she has experienced a solution. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, got a question from Brad, Brad G in Boston. Hey. Brad. Am I unmuted? You are. Am I? Okay, I am. Millie, thank you so much. Uh, you and I got sober about 12 days be between us. Nice. <laughs> I got sober the 1st of July in 84 and I was so, so happy to see your, your date. Nice. And thank you so much for uh, for this wonderful presentation. I am actually in process of ordering a copy of the book right now. Okay. Uh, I found an, a resale site that has a, a, a used copy of the book. Huh? Uh, I don't so much have a question as, as a comment that we have changed a great deal in the years since we all lived in the closet and terrified and um, Alcoholics Anonymous has been a big piece of that, a big piece of helping us overcome both of the stigma and the internalized homophobia that many of us have suffered over these years. Um, I am deeply grateful for the men and women who went before us and made it all possible for all of us and millie you're one of them <laughs> thank you very much all right thank you so much i appreciate it thanks brad well if there's no more questions i'll finish with the normal the final one i haven't been able to ask this question for a couple of uh, weeks so <laughs> thank you very much for your time um it's been wonderful Miley. I'm, I'm so grateful for you to coming along um and again we'll put all the contact details uh, when we upload it onto the various uh, platforms so people can get a hold of you and uh, and ask you questions or find out when your next speaking or when your next talk is. So the question of oh, the, the question is this, and you, the end, you, you can't just say, you know, disclaim, you can't say your own book or the big book. Oh, okay. Okay? So just, just get out of the way. Or from there. So book sales have gone through the roof and all of a sudden you find yourself, you're a quamillionaire. You've, you've, the money has been rolling in and such is your wealth that you decide to buy yourself a super yacht and <laughs> set sail from wow. underneath the, uh, the Golden Gate <laughs> and you head out to the Pacific and you've got all your worthy possessions on this super yacht and you've got this, you know, staff, you and your wife are having a great time, you're just lazing <laughs> about in the sun. And, but however, somewhere off the coast of Fiji, you strike a submerged coral reef and your precious super yacht starts to sink. So. You chuck the wife overboard, you chuck all the crew overboard, they swim to a nearby deserted island, and all you've got time is to rush down to your precious bookcase with a plastic bag, chuck your favourite book in the bag, dive overboard, and swim to safety, where you can await rescue reading this book. What's the book? Who's it by? And why? Oh my goodness. Well, I'll start out by saying I don't have a book, so that's easy. That's a, I have no books of my own. Here, let me look at a bookshelf here. You know, I think I would... Gosh, I don't know. One book. Well, you know what? Let's go. I'm going to say the biography of Mrs. Marty Mann. That's the story you're going to get. This is not my book, to be clear. But um, I would probably, or, you know, the other interesting book 
is the book that started it all. That actually shows the original, but that's kind of cheating because that's big book adjacent. So that's a, that's a cheat. But honestly, I, I'm I'm also an artist and I love art. And so maybe I would try to find a book on the history of women in art. That's what I would do. Okay, good answer. Well, listen, <laughs> I'm going to end recording now. And uh, thank you. We'll see you all this time next week on Monday. Thanks again, Miley. I'm just going to stop recording. See you later. Good night.